If you have your Bible, please get them and turn them to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This letter that we have been learning from. A letter that was written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Lord, His Holy Spirit, so that we may know and learn God's will, God's ways for our lives even today. If you are able to stand, please stand with me as we read 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 from verse 17 to 31. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that calling in which he was called. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one from the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you, do not, you have not sinned. And if, if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they had not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. Let us pray. Father in heaven, once again, we just thank you for the freedom that we can continue not only to gather together, but to read your word publicly. It is important for us to hear your very precious words, for they are truth and they are life, and they are the words of the Spirit. And so I pray, Lord God, that even as I speak the message, Lord God, that you have given for us, that your Holy Spirit would enable each one to hear your voice and give us, Lord God, the illumination in our hearts to renew our minds, to change our lives, for you are worthy to live, for us to live a life that is a life of worship unto your name. This we ask for the glory and honor of your name, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may all be seated. The message title for this morning is Content Single. Happily married. Is it showing up? Yeah? It says screen mirroring. Heart of worship. There it is. Did it show? Yeah. Content, single, happily married. Are you a single person? Are you unmarried? Are you content? You can, and you should, especially if you're a Christian. If you're not, then let's listen to the Word of God. Are you married? Are you happily married? You can, and you should. 
if you're a believer of Christ. If you're not, let's listen to what God has to say. That's why we have this, not merely a subject matter, but a life principle, a truth that addresses this situations or conditions in life, not just in the past, but even in the present, and in, in, even in the tomorrow, if the Lord does not come yet. And so remember, we have been going through this letter that Paul wrote to a church that was filled with sins. And the reason they were filled with sin is because they were not living their lives according to the Word of God. That is what the Bible calls for us to live by faith. Faith is trusting God. The evidence is following His Word. But the church in Corinth was not doing that. They were living by human wisdom, human reason, which is based on observation, what I see, what I hear, hear, what I feel, what I can understand and figure out. And if it doesn't, then I'm not going to follow it. That's not faith. Sometimes faith is demonstrated when God speaks to us and we cannot figure it out. We still follow it nevertheless. And so here is a church that had different situations in life. Some were single, and they were hearing from their other church members because, remember, there was division. There were factions, and some group members perhaps were saying to the other group, if you're single, you ought to get married. And it's not good for you to remain single because, because God said it's not good for man to be alone. Not understanding that when God said that, the context is that, again, Adam was just a human being by himself. There was no other human being. So it's not good for man just for Adam to be a human being by himself. But God created a woman, and out of that husband and wife relationship that God created, all of us came. And now there's billions of people so that single people can actually have companionship, friendship, relationship, and not feel lonely or even alone. And so we've addressed this last week from verses 1 to 7. Where in verse 1, remember, it says there, it's good for man not to marry. It has its advantages. And we've learned some of the advantages of singleness from verse 32 to verse 35. Where it says that I would like you to be free from concern. Why? Because an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affair, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. But if you're a single person and a Christian and love the Lord as a single person, you can be filled with joy and be content, be fulfilled when you live your life for Christ. When you do what God wants you to do, not what other people tell you to do, especially if what they're giving you are just mere opinions. Sincere, makes sense, but opinions. But if what the people are giving you is the Word of God, then you listen to the Word of God. In a nutshell, that's the secret or the key of contentment and fulfillment of life in life, whether you're single or married. But he says back in, in uh, verse not only 2, but also in verse um, 9, that if you're an unmarried person and a single person, and you cannot control yourself, sexually that is, you better get married. 
Never in the Bible does it say, when you feel sad and lonely, get married. If you can't control yourself, it's better to marry than to sin and to burn in passion. But of course, that's not the only reason and purpose for people to get married. There's the other uh, purpose why God created marriage in the first place for procreation, for companionship that we have said, but also to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church as, the, as, as, as stated in Ephesians 5, verse 23 to 25. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord in the same way that the church submits to Christ. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, the relationship between Christ and the church. But also in Proverbs 5, 18 to 19, for that the husband and wife also to enjoy each other's love and expression of that love. But then if you're a single person that especially gifted by the Lord, then remain single. It's good. It's not bad. It's not sin. It is not wrong. Verse 1, it is good for man not to marry. But if ever you decide to get married, you're not sinning, as the Bible says. But understand this, marriage relationship has its responsibilities. You're not entering a relationship where you can get and benefit from, but you're entering a relationship where you can give. That's the focus of marriage, is giving to your spouse, not getting from your spouse. That's why when God said to Adam and Eve, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. Because when we were children, we were what? Dependent from our, from our parents. Getting from our parents. But when you get married, you leave that kind of relationship of depending and getting because you're entering a relationship where you're going to give. And so when you're a single person wanting to get married, understand that. But then he also says, if you're a married person, you can be content and fulfilled. Because you see, in the church in Corinth, there were people saying, you know, well, it's not good uh, for you to stay married, especially if your spouse is not a believer. You became a Christian, but your spouse doesn't want to be a Christian. You can't divorce. And so Paul addresses that issue and says, no, if you are married and you are both believers, then you must not, verse 10, a wife must not separate from her husband because you cannot divorce and remarry if you're both a believer. That is to say that the marriage of both faith, both Christians, in other words, is for a lifetime. As it says in verse 39, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In other words, death breaks the bounds of marriage. But then there was a situation where the husband claims to be a believer, but then lives in immorality. And so Christ, when he was here, gave the commandment, a concession, a permission in Matthew 19, verse 9, that when he says that if you divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery unless the cause is sexual immorality. Because sexual immorality is a sin that is practiced as a lifestyle. So that if a person says, I'm a Christian, but yet lives in sin. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, that person who practices sin is not a child of God. So therefore, by profession, the person says he's a believer, but by practice, he's proving he's not. And because of that, there is no longer a bind in marriage. There is a separation. And so, if you are married and both of you are believers, you cannot divorce and remarry unless of death, 
physically and less of sexual immorality or death spiritually. At that, if the unbelievers want to leave. But if the believers want to stay and live with the believer, the Bible says, don't divorce. That's what it says in verse 12. But if you still insist as believers, I really want to separate. Back to verse 10, 11, it says, if she does divorce, that person, wife or husband, must remain unmarried. God will allow you to separate as believers, but you must remain. You cannot remarry. Or else it says, be reconciled to her husband. What's the point of all this? Well, it's what is our lesson this morning. That in whatever situation you find yourself, whether you're single or you're married, you can be and you ought to be content, happy, in one word, fulfilled. Because your happiness, contentment, or fulfillment is not dependent on your situation or your condition, but it's dependent on your relationship with God, who is the source of everything that we need, not just materially, but even emotionally. He's the one who fills us when our cup runs dry, fills us with the living water that is supposed to overflow. But then what happens when a Christian, a single or married, doesn't experience the fulfillment, the contentment, the happiness? In a nutshell, it's this. That person is not following Christ. It's not following the Word. It's listening to many other voices, even his or her own voice. A voice and a word that makes sense. Human wisdom. But that's not how God wants us to live. He wants us to learn contentment, fulfillment in whatever situation we find ourselves. That's why in verse 17, as we have read, each one of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God called you. This is the rule I give for all the churches. As an apostle author, authorized by the Lord to represent Him and to give His word, Paul says, this is the directive. That if you are a single person or a married person or once were married but now is unmarried, whatever situation you find yourself in, you continue to live in that. Remain as you were when God called you. When God called you, that means when God saved you. Every believer is called the called of God. Remember Romans 8.28? All things work together for the good of those that love Him and are the called according to His purpose. Sometimes we forget that as Christians. As single, we forget that we are called for His purpose. Not for what I want to do. Sometimes I get married, people get married forgetting that. There's a purpose for this. It's not simply for me to enjoy and be happy. <laughs> and if I'm no longer happy, I quit. There's a purpose for that marriage. Not just for procreation, not just for companionship, not just for enjoyment, but to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. So each one, it says there, was called by God. Continue. You don't have to change your situation. You can be a Christian. You can follow Christ in whatever condition or situation you find yourself in. You can live for Christ as a single person. You can live for Jesus even as married people. But it's not just talking about marriage and singleness. It's a principle that covers every area of life, cultural or social. That's why when we read this earlier, it was talking about circumcision. 
Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. So people, why are we talking about circumcision, Pastor? Well, you see, in the Bible, circumcision is representative not just of the physical ritual of circumcision, but it's representative of two groups of people. The circumcision group and the uncircumcision group. The circumcision group are the Jews whom God made a covenant with and the sign of their covenant is circumcision. And so they pride themselves as the people of God, the covenant people of God, and they pride themselves of that because of that sign. And anyone who wants to be in the kingdom of God, they would say, or enjoy the benefits of being in the kingdom of God, they would say to the Gentiles, you need to become like us. You need to go to the ritual of circumcision and be part of the circumcision group. And that's exactly what happened when Paul wrote to the Galatians because uh, Peter, who was a Jew, was connecting with the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles, fellowshipping with the Gentiles that the Jew has forbidden because they are uncircumcised. But then, he was doing that, but then a group of Jewish people from Jerusalem, whose leader was James, the brother of Jesus, Peter left the Gentiles. And that's what it says in Galatians 2 verse 12, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he, that is Peter, began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group, the Jews. And then Gentiles were called in circumcision in Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that done in the body by the hands of men. And so I'm just clarifying that so that you understand as we go back to verse 18 to 19. Were you, are you a Jew, not only racially but culturally, when you became a Christian? You don't have to denounce your Jewishness and become like a Gentile just to be accepted by them. Were you a Gentile when you were called, when you became a Christian? You don't have to give in to these demands of the Jewish people just to be accepted by them and become Jewish. In other words, don't be pressured by what people might say or demand of you. That, my friend, is a way to live a life in discontent and unhappiness. When you live your life based on what people say and you want to please them, rather than doing what God says, even though it might not please the people around you. The key to fulfillment, contentment in life, whether you're a single person, is following Jesus, living for Jesus. And that's why it says in verse 19, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. In other words, it doesn't matter whether they're a Jew or a Gentile. Because what counts is, what keeping God's command is what counts. That's really what matters. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Whether you're single or you're married. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition which he was called. But not just culturally, but even socially. And so in verse 21 to 22, it says, Were you a slave when called? Remember, back in the days, the social status, they were the haves and the have-nots. And the haves were the masters and their own slaves. The have-nots. And there were Christians, slaves who became Christians. And in their minds, they're being you know, uh, ridiculed and, 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 and put down by the free people. And they're thinking, I cannot be a Christian this way. And though, so, verse 21 says, Were you a slave when called when you, when you became a Christian? Do not be concerned about it. Don't worry about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. You don't have to be free, but if you can be free, by all means. But if you cannot be free, doesn't mean you can't be a Christian. Doesn't mean you, can, you cannot follow Christ. Why? Verse 22, For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. That is to say, in that situation or condition that you are, whether you're the employee or a slave, 
you can still serve the Lord, do things as unto the Lord, not as unto men. When you do things, not just in the church, but in your workplace, especially you have a supervisor or a manager or a boss that's unreasonable, it's easy to be affected. And you, you get affected by the emotion, the thought of frustration, annoyance, what have you. And then you don't, be, you don't live as a Christian anymore. And that's what Paul is saying. Were you a slave? Listen. Even though you were a slave when God called you, verse 22, you are Christ, you are the freedman of the Lord. You can follow Christ in that most unjust situation. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You may not be a slave. You may be the master. You may be the employer. You may be the boss. It doesn't give you the right to do whatever you can because you are the slave of Christ. That is to say, you are his servant and Christ is your master. You do also what Christ tells you to do as a boss, as a supervisor, as a master. You cannot be abusive because Christ is not abusive. You are to be just and even kind. And so, we are to live our lives for the Lord, for Jesus. Why? Because, verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Christ paid for us the high price of His precious, sinless blood. The blood of the Lamb of God that was shed on the cross. Imagine there's no other blood that can purify your sin. Not the sin of a pastor, not the sin of a priest, uh, not the blood of a pastor, not the blood of a priest, not of the blood of the Pope. Because all men have sinned. But only the Lamb of God has a sinless blood. Because He's God who became man. He's not man who became a saint. And God so loved you, God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God paid a high price. So don't be a slave and become slaves of men. Don't let men tell you what you ought to do and how to live your life. Let Christ do that. Follow Christ. Don't be pressured by what people say. Don't even pressure yourself on what you think is right. Seek the Lord. Ask the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Cry to the Lord. And live for Him as He speaks to you. It says in the New Living Translation, God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. That is to say, don't follow. Don't follow what you see on TV, the celebrities, you know. Don't, don't follow the behavior, the customs of the society and the culture that we live in. You belong to Christ. You belong to God. You no longer belong to this world, even though you may still be in this world. You are not of this world. You are of Christ and you belong to the kingdom of God, and as belonging to the kingdom of God, we must live our lives according to kingdom rules, not world and society, culture. And so, brothers and sisters, in whatever condition each was, which was called, let, there let each man remain with God. Don't have the idea that you have to change your situation. If you can, yes, but not for the idea of I'll be more happy if I do this. I'll be more happy if I go here. No. Happiness is not something that we achieve. Therefore, it's happiness is not something that we need to pursue. Happiness is not to be our goal or even concern. It's not even God's goal or concern for us to be happy. God's goal for us is to be holy to be different, to be like Him. And happiness just comes along as a byproduct for our obedience 
to Him. And so now He addresses the single, particularly in verse 25 now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married. In other words, virgins. I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. And what is that? Verse 26. Because of the present crisis, I think it is good for you to remain as you are, meaning single. And what's the present crisis that Paul was talking about? Well, back in the time period, the Christians were being persecuted. Rome not only hated the Christians, they wanted not only to put Christians in prison and persecute them, some of them were actually martyred or be put to death, especially by, by that Roman uh, Caesar Nero, who used many of the Christians and tied them on their trees or lamp or post and lit them up to be what? Like a torchlight for his evening garden. Imagine the evil and the wickedness of that Caesar Nero. And so as a single person, imagine the concern of persecution. Even as an individual, the concern of persecution looms over your head. It's something that you think about, right? How much more if you're married? How much more if you have a wife or a husband and you have children? The concern is no longer just limited to you. The concern is for your family. And that's why Paul encourages them, the Corinthians, that it's good for you to remain as a single person. Now, having said that, he's not suggesting that married people divorce so that they can become single. And that's why he says in verse 27, are you married? Do not seek a divorce. You see that? Christians, remember this. God hates divorce. It's not God's plan. If you can remain in the situation that you are in, God says you can. And not only you can, but you can actually be fulfilled. But if you insist on your own way, I give you directives. By deaths, physical, sexual immorality, or by spiritual death. In other words, an unbeliever. Other than that, you cannot and you must not. But if you insist again, then you must remain single. Were you once married, but now unmarried? He says in verse 27, are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. Okay. Paul is not recommending anything here. He's, he, I'm rather not recommend. He's not commanding anything here. He's just showing to the single person the benefits of singleness. But if you decide to get married, verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. True. So true. As a single person, there's already enough trouble. Is it not? As a single person, there's already troubles in life. You have, because you have your own likes, you have own dislikes, you have your own emotion, you have your own mindset, you have your own ways of doing things. Imagine you as a single person with all these troubles... You get married with his own set of troubles. You press them together. Trouble is doubled. Of course, there's benefits of marriage that we've talked about. But I'd like us to understand that marriage does not solve every problem of a single person. And some people who are sad and lonely as a single person and singing there in the house by themselves, lonely. I'm Mr. Lonely. I, I need to get married. Thinking that when they get married, they'll be happy. Loneliness, marriage doesn't solve loneliness. There are a lot of people who are lonely single and have brought their loneliness in marriage. Again, because again, listen. Contentment, fulfillment, and happiness is not dependent on your situation or condition. It's in Christ and your relationship with Christ. 
until you discover the joy of knowing Jesus and living for Jesus that is following Christ, you will never find fulfillment and contentment in anything, in any relationship, any situation in this life. I've learned that myself. And so, besides that, besides that he says that he wants uh, that the married people in verse 28 will face many troubles in life and I want to spare you this. Another reason is in verse 29. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. In other words, our lives here, temporary. We, we will not live here on this planet Earth in this life that we have, whether single or marriage, for all eternity. This is just here and it's temporary. As the Bible says, our life is just like a vapor. It's a mist. You see it and it's gone. That's how not only fragile but fleeting life is. And so what the Bible is focusing on here is this. Whatever situation, again, you find yourself in, live it for Christ as a single person. Take advantage of your singleness so that you can devote your time, your energy, your everything for Christ. But as a married person, yes, you have your family, and you need to take care of your family, but don't let your family prevent you or even slow you down to serving and following what Christ wants you to do. The problem has become when Christians, become, when Christians get married and they have families, they make their families as an excuse not to follow Christ, not to serve Christ. Pastor, family kasi? All the Bible is telling you is don't neglect your family. If you need to do something, but God tells you to do something, then find someone who can help you to take your place while you're doing what God wants you to do, whatever that may be. To some are called into missions. To some are called in a Sunday morning worship service. It's not limited in those things but even in everyday life. But then there are people who don't like their family, don't like family responsibility, so there they are serving the Lord in every mission opportunity they go. They're, in other words, they're making what? God as, as an excuse not to serve their families. Don't go to that extreme either. Time is short. Live for the Lord whatever... In whatever situation you find yourself in. That's why it says in verse 29, From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. You see that? You're a married person, but don't make that relationship your reason not to follow Christ. You're married, and the Bible's not saying to ignore that or to neglect that. But live your life as though you had none. Meaning, still live for Christ. Regardless of what your wife might say when God calls you to do something. Is that clear? From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. In a... New Living Translation, it says there, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. See that? There are Christians who are making their family and their focus is all there. Well, you know, family is my first priority. <laughs> you don't find that in the Bible. Seek first. The rule and the authority of God. That is to say to put God, your focus, your priority. Not what you think is noble. 
But what God says is right. His righteousness. Yeah. Uh, then they begin to rationalize things. That's human wisdom. S instead of just trusting God and obeying Him. But it's not only in relations, but also in emotion. Because these things of the world are the things that control a man. Relationship. And then there's the emotion. Verse 30 to 31. Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not. Isn't that emotion? Single person, you feel sad. You mourn. You're married, you're happy. But sometimes you're also sad and you mourn. The point is, whatever you may be feeling, don't let that emotion take control of you. Don't let the emotion be the one to dictate what you do. It's not wrong or sin to have emotion. God has blessed us with emotion. We've said that so many times. It's a wonderful blessing for us to feel happiness, to express our sadness and grief in crying. But it's, that is not to govern to rule or to dictate our lives. The problem is when we're not in the mood and we feel sad, many don't follow or obey the Lord because I'm not in the mood. I woke up not in the mood. There are many times I, woke, I, I wake up on a Sunday morning and I'm not in the mood. Imagine if I let my emotions take control of me. A lot of Sundays, I would not be here. But isn't that hypocritical over you to go to church and you're not feeling? Well, feelings come and go. But the truth is, in my heart, I love the Lord and I want to serve the Lord. Although I just don't feel like it. But my feeling is not the truth. Because my heart's desire is the truth, and my heart's desire is to what? Serve Him! So don't let your emotions take control of you. And not only emotions, not only relations or emotions, but also possessions. It says there, as those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those are possessions. And so many Christians, their focus in life, preoccupation in life, is what? Things and the acquisition of things. We're now married, pastor, and we have to work, work, work so that we can have all the things. And that's now their preoccupation and focus in life. So that's what they do. They work, work, work. No time with the family. No time for the family. And worse, no time for the family of God. So he says, those who buy something, I say, if it were not theirs to keep. Don't live your life absorbed with these things. Yes, you have possessions, but don't live your life as if it's yours forever and that you are going to keep them, even your emotions. It's not saying to deny your emotions. Don't, don't deny that you're feeling sad. I, I, how are you? I'm happy. He's not saying that. To deny your emotions, but rather deny yourself in listening to what your emotions dictate. Acknowledge I'm sad. Acknowledge I'm not in the mood. But I'm not gonna I'm gonna deny that dictation of the emotion to fulfill what I want to do. But rather I'll follow Christ. Same thing with possession. And finally, not just relation, not just emotion, not just possession but also pleasure or leisure. Verse 31, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. What does engrossed mean? So interested, so enjoying. Pleasure, such as vacation time, day off, early retirement, and all that stuff. And that is what you're living for. That's what you're pursuing, focusing on. More pleasure in life. 
whatever that might be. Okay? And I, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what exhilarates me when I can hike the highest peak. Don't let that engross you. Why? Because this world in its present form is passing away. In, NI, in New Living Translation, it says, those who weep or those who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them for this world as we know it will soon pass away. Imagine your focus on these things. You're living for these things, but in the end, it all be gone. Worthless. So don't live for this. Come to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Sing to Jesus. Worship Him. You feel sad? Cry to Jesus. You feel happy? Dance for Jesus. When you die, it's time to live. Fly to Jesus. Let your life be all about Jesus. That's why it says in verse, uh, in, in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, Do not love this world or the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving. In other words, a lust for, for physical pleasure. That's the lust of the flesh. A craving for everything we see. That's the lust of the eyes. And a pride in our achievements and possessions. That's the, the pride of life. These are not from the Father, but from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Oh, bright lights, but it will fade away. Oh, new. I'm not going to say it because I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm being tempted to buy one, but new iPhone. Yeah, well, new iPhone. <laughs> I mean, if you need one, by all means, but... But if you don't need one, you're just attracted to it, like me, then don't listen to that. But then, my current iPhone 7 is starting to hyperventilate. <laughs> so, so, should I thank you, God? The point here is not to be living for this world. Live in the world, but remember you're not of this world. And so I end with this verse. Romans 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Do you really trust the Lord? Then follow Him. What's holding you back? Your own opinion? What people might say might happen, it might not happen. You're being slaves of men. Don't be slaves of men. Don't let the word world and its culture, society, and behavior pressure you to be what they want you to be. If you say you're a Christian, then come to Jesus and let Him renew your mind so that you won't live your life based on human wisdom, understanding, but that you will live your life by faith. Why are you doing this? Because God said so. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter. I'll trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. When it's all about you, it's all about